Welcome all. Uh, my name is Tristan Edis. I'm the editor of a uh, climate change and energy publication called Climate Spectator. Uh, I'll be your chair for this evening. Um, you've already met Christine, um, and I'll introduce the, the rest of the members of the, uh, the panel. So to my right, we have Kane Thornton. Kane is the deputy CEO of the Clean Energy Council, which is the industry association for the Australian renewable energy industry, amongst other things. Uh, he's also the president of the Alternative Technology Association. Um, he might want to explain what that means. Um, uh, but they are a long-standing um, uh, group of, of people who have been uh, driving, I suppose, uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy uh, in this country. And he has also worked at Hydro Tasmania, Austrade and IBM. Then we have uh, Tony Wood. Tony Wood is the uh, Program Director of the Grattan Institute's Energy Research Program and also the Program Director of the Clean Energy Program with uh, former President Bill Clinton's uh, uh, foundation. And he has 11 years prior experience to that working at Origin Energy, so he has a deep uh, level of experience in the Australian energy sector. And, and lastly, we have uh, uh, Malti uh, Meinsalzen. I think I've pronounced that correctly. Um, probably not. Um, uh, he, he's a climate, uh, a climate scientist uh, at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, which is a, uh, a very um, famous and, and well-credentialed research group into uh, climate change uh, issues in, uh, globally, and also uh, a researcher with the University of Melbourne um, and has been a contributing author to the IPCC's fourth assessment report uh, and also involved in um, a numerous other uh, areas such as advising the German government and also advising on accounting rules for uh, international emissions trading. So, first of all, I thought it'd be worthwhile going to the climate scientist. After all, that's what it's all about, uh, ultimately, to, to multi. So, to contain temperature rise uh, of global warming to two degrees, uh, how rapidly do we need to um, phase out fossil fuels and replace them with renewable energy and other forms of very low emission energy? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk. And uh, working in climate science means um, if you get such a report, you put that in the same drawer where all your antidepressive pills are, because in climate science we don't have so many good news um, to look out for. And so seeing these numbers, how renewable really takes off, this is great news and it kept, uh, keeps us alive. Um, for the two degree target, this is what the international community um, signed up to. Um, two degrees is by no means, as you know, a safe target. Um, just this week, uh, our studies were showing again, the coral reefs are facing long-term degradation even at levels of 1.5 degrees global warming, unless miracles appear. So two degrees is not a safe target, but it's what the international community signed up to, and it will prevent much larger climate disasters that are, as a surprise, coming um, our way if we would crank up global temperatures even beyond that. For two degrees, there are, there are a couple of milestones necessary in terms of global emissions. We have to peak before 2020. In just the next year, uh, 10 years, we have to peak global emissions. Do we do that at the moment? Are we on track? Absolutely not. Can two degree be still achieved? Absolutely yes. We have the scientific studies that show it's economically doable. We have the technologies for it. The big thing that from science we can't predict is, is there the political will? And we as scientists shouldn't make any judgments about the, whether the political is there. But again, such a positive news from renewable energies might in the end spur the political will that it is doable, it is taking off, it is producing lots of Co good uh, co-benefits, so um, we can actually go on that path. Two degrees is doable in the longer term, and that is where renewable energies are really important. By 2050, globally, we have to half emissions um, below 1990 levels, and by 2070, we have to aim for a zero carbon economy worldwide. In the global average, we shouldn't emit any more carbon into the atmosphere. 
effectively after 2070, we should try to get back as much as possible out of the atmosphere again. So the time frame it is in the long term, but there are near term steps before 2020, bending that global emission curve. And there, I think renewable is absolutely essential. China is their great success story. On the other hand, we live in a schizophrenic world. China, as well, has the biggest add-on of coal consumption just in that last year. China's per capita emissions are now the same as the EU ones with fossil and industrial CO2 emissions. It's still a bit below the Australian per capita emissions. Um, but so we have very schizophrenic world there. On the one side, we have these huge increases in emission because of huge increases in fossil fuel use. And on the other side, we have these very positive stories about renewable energy actually taking off. So in terms of the time frame, um, it is very tight. Without renewable, it's, we wouldn't make it. It's absolutely essential. Probably with only focusing on renewables and not focusing on the other guys actually in decreasing their incentives, we wouldn't achieve the two degree targets as possible, um, but there's a lot of work to be done. So uh, are we talking, say, um, in, in, in a developed country like Australia at the moment, we have, uh, emit one tonne of, of CO2 for every um, uh, megawatt hour of electricity uh, we receive. You know, what sort of timetable would we be thinking about if, if we sort of had to replicate that to just sort of give people a dimension of it? Well, how fast do we need to get it down to, say, 0.2? Or um, if we were thinking about the globe, how, how fast do we have to um, essentially have, say, 100% uh, renewables in electricity supply, for example, in order to have a, a chance of... Obviously, there are other areas that we need to decarbonise as well, but mm. have you got a feel for that? When you break down global emissions, it depends a bit on the assumption about what each country should do. What is the capacity of the country to do? What is the historical contribution to climate change? How much is the ethical responsibility for a country to do? And there you can obviously come to different value judgments. Um, in the international climate negotiations, there are kind of two large camps out there. Per capita emissions should converge around 2050. And then we are talking about, yes, the electricity as well in Australia should be rather carbon neutral by 2050, 2060, 2070. Um, the other camp says, well, the industrialized nations already used up so much emissions in the past, so they have to act first and foremost and uh, really invest heavily, if that is not done by investing in renewable energies in other co developing countries like China and India, but it's done domestically, then we are looking at a decarbonisation theoretically within 10 years. Right. Uh, that's a pretty big challenge. Um, now, we've, we've heard about rapid growth in, in renewables, but in absolute numbers, we've still got a, a huge challenge ahead of us. Um, uh, you talked about uh, an, an enabling policy framework. Uh, what, what do you see as the, the key characteristics? Looking around the world, what are the things that are, are the right sort of things that we should be doing uh, if we're going to be able to um, scale up renewable energy, drive its costs down, um, improve its performance? Yeah, effectively, I mean, what you say is uh, there is, a, as I mentioned, we have a roughly 17% of renewables in, in final, final energy consumption. Um, that means that 83% are, are, are non-renewable and there is still a big way to go. Um, and uh, at least in Europe, we have spent a lot of time debating about what is uh, good policy and what is the right policy. And uh, there was a lot of discussion on whether it is all about harmonizing uh, different uh, policy instruments and just using one for the whole European Union. And ultimately, uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, in, in reality, whatever framework you have in place does not matter so much. I mean, we see in the report that feed-in tariffs uh, seem to be very successful. There are now 65 countries all around the world 
uh, and 27 states having feed-in tariffs in place. However, we also see that, that other countries are making good progress with renewable portfolio standards, with uh, reverse auctioning, such as Brazil recently. So I, I think it's not so much uh, about, the, um, ab about the choice of the policy instrument. This depends very much on the overall uh, energy policy framework that is in place in the country. However, what we do see is that long-term predictability and stability are absolutely key. They are key for the industry uh, to, uh, to orientate uh, their, their growth plans and they are also key for uh, driving investment in a way that, uh, that it uh, comes into a market. And, uh, and, and, and we see, I mean, I think it's very encouraging to see that there are now uh, 120 countries around the world having policy targets. Uh, but it is absolutely key that these targets are not revised on a, on a continuous basis, but they are really uh, stable and they really uh, explain the ambition uh, on, on where a country or where a region really wants to go. Okay, so if we wanted to axe a tax uh, that we just set up, that probably wouldn't be such a good idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, who am, who am I here to judge about? Uh, uh, well, would that constitute stability? <laughs> no, uh, that's, not, that's for sure not. <laughs> uh, that's Predictability. Not the case. And, uh, and I think um, Australia is in the process of, uh, of putting in place uh, with the red uh, and, uh, and with the carbon price a framework that, uh, that orients the country in the right direction. And I think that uh, it is absolutely key that these measures are, uh, are kept uh, at, the, at the stable level as much as possible. So um, when people are, uh, I mean, what's the sort of time frame that we're talking about here? Because some people will say, um, but renewable energy, you know, this stuff, I've given, you know, we're giving it a handout um, today. Um, when's it going to end? Um, you know, what, what's the sort of time frames we're talking about with trying to, um, essentially grow the muscles on these immature technologies, uh, what sort of time frame should we be putting in place to, uh, to see some kind of stability? What, 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 what do they need in order to, to, to get themselves to a point where um, we should reasonably expect them to be able to compete against um, the, the older guys in the, um, the, play, the playground? Well, I think we have to, to, to bear in mind that our uh, energy system uh, is uh, set up based on, on fossil fuels and, uh, and that there are the new entrants, the new players into the game uh, that, that, that come in here to uh, compete on the ground that is not absolutely fair. If I just cite some numbers of the International Energy Agency, in 2010 there were 409 billion US dollars spent on fossil fuel subsidies globally and there were 66 billion uh, spent on renewable support. And I think that puts things already in proportion. So we are, we are not talking about the level playing field that uh, today is, is really ready to, to show <coughs> real prices and, uh, and to have renewables compete to the fair level. Uh, we, however, also see that, um, that there is a lot of uh, talk that when uh, you really uh, upscale renewables, that, that, that clearly uh, the need for support is going down and we have seen uh, several policy frameworks such as the German one which is often the model that is referred to where um, they have chosen, they have opted for, uh, for feed-in tariffs but where uh, the design of the poly policy framework is evolving in a way that um, there is a certain digression introduced into the tariffs and there is a, a perspective given that uh, on a long term in uh, consultation and in coordination with the industry this, this framework will effectively uh, adapt and, and, uh, and will reduce uh, because on the one hand uh, to, uh, to incorporate the, uh, the cost reductions of the technology and then on the other hand of course also to, um, uh, to, 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 to make uh, the whole support system um, financially sound and, and viable. So is it, is it about a government will say, look, I'm going to give you support, I'll give it to you over reasonably over say um, 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. but uh, that support will decline steadily over time. So if you don't improve and you don't get better and you don't get cheaper, then um, essentially you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be weaned off. Well, I think they won't be weaned off because the statistics already show that, that they're getting 
uh, cheaper over time. And, and I don't know that there are many se sectors that can effectively showcase such a steep uh, price decline as we've seen, for example, for, for uh, PV modules. By the way, something that uh, hardly anybody has ever predicted. Uh, there was, there was, I mean, on all the scenarios and all the forecasts from the IA and from different other organizations, you, you would never see on the one hand uh, such, uh, such, such high shares of PV in 2011. Uh, and you also don't see uh, such a rapid declining cost. And, and so the two go really together. And, um, and yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's an accepted uh, fact that a policy framework has to evolve over time. And I think what is important is that there is consultation and there is discussion between the public and the private sector, because again, uh, that has to happen uh, in, in, in consultation. And uh, the ones are setting the framework and the other ones, the industry is really making it happen. Okay. Um, Kane, you're the guy with the handout for the renewable energy industry. Um, uh, to what extent it, has Australia got that what, what might be considered um, a stable framework, a framework that enables companies to to invest, to to essentially improve improve their capability, improve the technology. Um, uh, are, are we there yet? Um, could we improve? Um, have we been horrible in the past? Um, look, uh, firstly, um, th thanks and, uh, and good evening. Um, I guess from our perspective, um, there's no doubt Australia's got the, essentially the policy platform and it, it goes back to the renewable energy target uh, that was introduced in 2001. Um, it's been highly effective and it is essentially uh, what we talk about as being investment grade policy and that is uh, it's a policy mechanism that's in place and it allows large scale investors make um, make investments uh, of, into energy generation plant that operates for 15, 20, 30 years, and it gives them the confidence to be able to make those investments and, and essentially recover uh, those investments over the life. So in our view, there's absolutely no doubt, and I think Christine spoke about um, many other countries around the world, in fact, that have followed Australia's lead with a, a very similar type scheme. So there's no doubt in our view that, that, that the platform's there. Um, it has been highly effective over the last, over the last decade. Uh, but we have more recently seen a period of, of policy instability and some of that has been about uh, the change, the extension and the um, changes to the renewable energy target. I think it's fair to say they're now behind us. Um, we've now seen a, a period of, of pretty uh, fairly toxic debate about a carbon price and to a certain degree um, that's behind us. And so what we're starting to see in the renewable sector is all of this pent up investment over the last sort of three to five years start to be unlocked and investors starting to get the confidence that the policy settings are right now. Uh, we've got a target to get to 20% renewables out to 20, 2020. Uh, we've got some work to do, but um, all of, if you like, the building blocks are now there for us to, uh, to get on and start making real progress. And as a result, you're seeing uh, large-scale wind projects start to be built around the, around the country. We're seeing uh, commercial and large-scale solar projects start to, start to actually make progress. I should add as well uh, that more recently, uh, with the introduction of the carbon price, with the establishment of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and also the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Uh, these are really important institutions with pretty significant capital to be also be able to support essentially the next wave of technologies. And so these are things like large-scale solar, like geothermal, like ocean energy, where these technologies are still, they're still coming out of the laboratory. Um, they're starting to scale up. Um, they're starting to be demonstrated and tested in, in the Australian uh, particular circumstances uh, and over time we're optimistic that those institutions will help really drive them forward so we can achieve the 20% target um, but we can really push well beyond that with a lot of different technology options and ultimately at as low a cost as possible. Um, I, I want to set up some renewable energy plans and I go off to the bank. What, what are the sorts of things, what's the bank want to see in terms of, uh, of a time scale? Um, for them to feel some degree of comfort that they can can lend you some some money. Is it you know a three years? You know the government sort of says, hey, you know you guys should be right after three years. Or is that is that the sort of thing that we're talking about for for banks to feel happy to to lend money to um, renewable energy project developers and companies? Look, look, I mean these are these are big investments, um, 
and as I said earlier, it's generally around about the 15 year period. That's the, that's the period in which banks like to see the, essentially the investment paid off. Now a lot of these projects will, will operate for longer than that. But ultimately therefore, um, both the developers and essentially the, the financiers and the banks need to take a, a 15 year view around the policy settings, what will be essentially the value of the electricity that's produced from the, from the wind farm or the development, uh, what will be the value of the renewable energy certificates under the, under the renewable energy target scheme, and essentially want to see that all of that adds up um, sufficiently to pay off the investment over 15 years. So we've seen this sort of short-term policy debate, um, carbon price on, off, uh, carbon price tweaked. Uh, we've seen the renewable energy target uh, expanded in 2009. We saw it enhanced and split out in 2010 and in fact now we're in the midst of a review of the scheme uh, all of that over a say three or four year period of time when again these investors are looking over over a 15 year period and trying to make sense of the policy settings and essentially have enough confidence to put large amounts of capital in place to make those investments happen. Okay. Um, Tony, <coughs> renewable energy isn't the only way that Australia or indeed the world can reduce their emissions. Um, and it's probably not the cheapest one, certainly to reach the government's 2020 emissions reduction target. Um, how on earth are we going to prioritise between all of these wealth of options that we've got and some which are, are more expensive but might be really important in the long term versus others that are cheap today but maybe aren't going to get us all the way that we need to go? I guess <coughs> one of the questions that emerges when you look at structure of the policies we've had to date, because they don't tend to do the sort of thing you've been talking about. Um, you know, from the 1st of July this year, Australia made a significant step in that we have now put a price on the emissions that we produce from the electricity we consume. And that, by itself, will do certain things, and it's starting to do certain things, and the sky hasn't fallen, and so we'll start to see that gradually uh, make more of a difference over the short term. Um, but to add a little bit to what Malta was saying before, and I, and I would re recommend to you, you might have a look at the World Energy uh, Outlook under the IEA's um, current report, which is going to be updated towards the end of this year. And one number that really struck me quite bleakly was, or coldly, was that if you want to stay within the two degrees that Malta was talking about, to meet that, if from now on, we build no new power stations that produce greenhouse gas emissions, no more cars, no more industrial processes. We're already 80% of the way there. If we don't stop by 2017, we're 100% of the way there. So in the words of the IEA, the door is closing. And that means that we've got to start moving things quite rapidly in the way that, that, that Tristan may be implying. It seems to me that one of the things that's changed with the Emissions Trading Scheme introduction is the fundamental nature of where the complementary policy should be. So, for example, before that, the Renewable Energy Target did deliver and has delivered quite significant greenhouse gas abatement at moderate cost, and you could debate how much abatement and how much cost, and lots of people are today debating that point. But what we're now seeing is a situation in which the Renewable Energy Target effectively has become industry policy. And industry's policy always brings out winners and losers. And so as a consequence, what you're seeing right now in the media, all this week, all last week, and we'll probably see for another few weeks yet, because of the review that was talked about, what you're seeing is this big debate. Because people are saying, wait a second, this renewable energy target isn't delivering um, low cost abatement anymore. The ETS will do that. What this is doing is producing very expensive renewable energy, and why should we be doing that? So you only have to look at the people who are saying that and what their commercial interests are to understand why they would say that, because exactly what's happening, and in particular in Australia, where energy demand is actually going down, what that means is the pie isn't getting bigger for the energy industry. And so now the renewable energy is eating somebody else's pie. Those people don't like it, and they're screaming very loudly. And you only have to see what was reported and the way people describe their response to the renewable energy target review and what they're calling for, either the abolition or the scaling back, or whatever you might want to say. So that's the context in which this whole debate's taking place. One of the challenges we have, I think, Tristan, coming back to the core point of your question, I think, is that in some ways we did this ass about in Australia. If we put in place our core climate change policy, and you can debate whether it's strong enough, because I don't think it is, but if we put that in place first, 
then you should truly have complementary policies that address the market failures and look to bring forward the technologies that are going to ultimately be lowest cost in the long term. And the one criticism that I have of the RET, the Renewable Energy Target, is it doesn't do that. What it does, as does the ETS, it delivers what's cheapest today. It's been very effective, as I said before, in delivering quite a bit of wind and some solar, as Cain mentioned. But what it hasn't done, and ETS doesn't do either, by the way, is bring forward technologies that could ultimately be lower cost in the future. And I think that's where the policy should be focusing, because I think in the short term, in Australia and elsewhere, as people become more concerned about energy prices in some parts of the world, thankfully not here, more concerned about energy security, those two will dominate the debate. And I think renewable energy actually is heading into some pretty severe stormy weather. Um, and I think that's going to be some big challenges globally for renewable energy. And as the IEA said, at the moment, the, big, the future of the renewable energy industry is in the hands of government policy, and I think the winds are going the other way, personally. On that negative note, let's go to questions <laughs> uh, from the floor. Okay, so we've got some roving mics. So if you can just put your hand up um, so that uh, the people with the mics can see you. Are they? Okay, but I like to control things, so uh -huh. the, the microphone acts as that. Yes, sorry, we've got someone in the red there. Yeah, yeah, I think your moment for control might be almost at an end, um, Tristan. Uh, I noticed that you and Tony, you are co-authors of this Grattan Institute, No Easy Choices, Which Way to Australia's Energy Future. Tony, hi, Andrew Lang, uh, board member of the World Bioenergy Association, and, and I'm always looking for emissions of the information about bioenergy when we're talking about Australia's energy policy, particularly renewable energies. It's the cheapest, it's the most jobs, it's the most carbon sequestration, it's generally emitted. And I'm, I'm always curious why. Christine knows that in Murek in southern Austria, 100% renewable, all from biomass, and Goosing in Austria, and Copenhagen, largely from biomass, heading towards zero emissions, Stockholm the same. Why is this? Why are, we, why are we emitting this when Martin Ferguson is saying uh, because uh, renewables just aren't producing, we are looking at a nuclear uh, rollout by 2020, 2025? Is there, is there something that, that we need to be doing to promote this, this emitted uh, renewable? Uh, so about bioenergy? About bioenergy, which is also heat, fuels, bioplastics, the whole thing that, uh, that is coming from biomass. Right. Well, Kane, um, you've got a few bioenergy members. Um, they qualify under the renewable energy target for support. What, what, what's going wrong? Um, look, a, a, f a few things, I guess. I mean, ultimately, I mean, part of the elegance, despite what Tony said, I think part of the elegance of the renewable energy target is ultimately it it's there to drive the deployment of the lowest cost renewable technologies. And uh, that's, um, that was originally, I think it's fair to say, bioenergy. Um, wind certainly came down in cost pretty quickly. And, uh, and at the moment, um, wind is the lowest cost form of the, of the proven renewables. And so to a certain degree, bioenergy is um, suffering from that. Uh, I mean, I think it, there, are other, there are other challenges. Um, they're about, in part, they're about grid connection, and that's a, an issue that's common to many other renewable forms, but certainly bioenergy um, faces challenges in getting connections to the grid at competitive prices, at, at getting access to the grid. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say, and some of the work that we've been doing has been, uh, bioenergy has a bit of an image problem. Um, uh, and part of the work we've been doing is to trying to address that, raise awareness about bioenergy, what it is, what it is not, and, uh, and giving both policy makers and the community a bit more of an understanding uh, about bioenergy. But so, to a certain degree, I think it does come back to the original point, which is uh, it's currently not the lowest cost of the technologies, and there's a decision essentially there for policy makers to say, uh, what is the target that Australia wants to achieve? How hard do we want to pull the lever? And uh, essentially, at what cost are we prepared to bring in different forms of renewable energy? Christine, um, you've, uh, particularly Germany as an example, has sort of said, taken a different approach to, in some respects to Australia and said, well, look, actually, we need multiple options and we need to progress them all in parallel. Uh, do you think maybe there's something where we should be looking at... Um, we're, we're, clearly, wind's got a, got a, a head of steam, I suppose. Um, Solar PV started to um, 
get running, but but bioenergy sort of left in the, the starting blocks. Um, uh, any any hints or clues? What uh, I think something that we have effectively in all our statements co completely omitted. What I think goes without say saying is that there is a need for R and D uh, for uh, further investigations in in renewable technologies because I think that all these different scenarios that uh, that we have we are discussing, be the IA, be the IPCC, they they base themselves on uh, on existing on today existing technologies and they show that even with what we have today we can make it. But it does it is clear that I think improvement in technologies in certain areas is absolutely key, and uh, and R and D is definitely uh, necessary and important. Uh, let me just comment on the on the issue of biomass and of bioenergy because effectively. It's a very complex one because we just do not talk about just one conversion route, but we talk about electricity generation, uh, about heating and cooling, and about uh, biofuels for transport. So the solution clearly is uh, is not um, is not uh, uh, the same. We see that uh, at least in Europe, uh, bioenergy is often used uh, as uh, a co-firing in, uh, in in coal plants. And I think, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm not fully aware about how much that is a practice that is really used in Australia, but uh, it's definitely uh, something there. And I think uh, one of the successes uh, that you, uh, Andrew, pointed to uh, about the fact of uh, Austria and, uh, and, and Scandinavian countries mainly uh, largely deploying and, uh, and investing uh, in biomass, and especially in biomass heat, is that farmers have uh, understood that uh, the, the, the sustainable uh, exploitation of forests and very often what we use uh, there to produce heat are the byproducts. It's not about uh, cutting down trees, but it's about really by, byproducts that, uh, that come out from, from, uh, from forests, that these can be additional sources of revenue for them. And, and uh, there is actually, I think, quite interesting that the whole farmers uh, conservative uh, a constituency was actively or is actively supporting the uh, the use of biomass and has really helped to um, uh, to, to to spread these uh, technologies and spread these developments and the Scandinavian countries Germany Austria they have lots of SMEs uh, and they have lots of uh, companies that are specialized in there and so there is a whole uh, also market uh, market pool that that was established there uh, on the other hand of course uh, there is always the discussion about uh, biomass and its relation to sustainability. And there we see also that, uh, that, that some parts of the world, or many parts of the world, uh, are struggling with defining sustainability criteria for, for the use of biomass. So there is, I think, still a lot of work that needs to be done and uh, where, where definitely uh, some, uh, some criteria need to be fixed because clearly when, uh, when talking about renewables, the, the usage of biomass should be, should be done in a sustainable way. Sure, but uh, I mean, fundamentally, in Europe, there are dedicated policy mechanisms to just drive biomass for, for example, whether it be biofuels or, or, or power generation or heat. Uh, absolutely, so uh, the way it works in, Euro in the European Union is that uh, we have this, at, this uh, mandatory target, the binding target of at least 20% renewable energy from final energy consumption by 2020. And this target is then broken down into national targets. So each uh, of the 27 European uh, countries have agreed to a certain share of renewables uh, by 2020. That ranges from 10% in Malta to 50% in Sweden. Uh, and then uh, each country came up with uh, a national renewable energy action plan that outlines measures in the field of electricity, in the field of heating and cooling, and in the field of transport uh, that, uh, that indicate um, with which measures the different member states uh, think to, uh, to reach the target. And there clearly, there is a big, big focus on, uh, on biomass there. Okay, thanks. Next question. Have we got a microphone to someone at the moment? Okay. Thank you. My question is related to wind power, wind energy. It seems that a lot of countries are installing more and more wind energy sources. Australia has enough uh, wind to establish that source here as well. What is the situation in Europe compared to Australia? 
are the people in Europe complaining that they are getting sick? Or is it something peculiar to Victorians or Australians? which will limit our capacity to install wind power. Christine. OK. Uh, yeah, I have heard that apparently wind turbines are particularly hostile here uh, <laughs> in, in Australia. Uh, I, I've heard this argument several times. Um, in, in our part of the world, it's not so much the, the health concern. There are, there are some, um, in some countries, there are effectively uh, some discussions going on on noise. And there were some uh, of the uh, of, of uh, consumer groups forming uh, against wind uh, in, in in some countries. So that there, there was some resistance. I don't think uh, up to the same level of uh, what you seem to get here. Um, but but clearly, uh, what we also see that many countries have overcome this uh, by uh, developing uh, community farm community wind uh, wind farm projects because it's very interesting that from the moment when a community uh, or when consumer groups are involved in the development of wind parks, suddenly they are not dangerous to the health anymore and they don't produce so much, uh, so much noise because they actually bring in revenue for the community and then suddenly they become quite interesting. So uh, there are a series of models out there uh, that, that show how that, uh, that apparent uh, or obvious or, or, or not obvious risk uh, can effectively easily be overcome. Okay, thank you. Yes, just here. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Gregory. I've actually worked in both the public and the private sector with respect to renewables. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that the approvals process, um, particularly in Victoria, can be quite cumbersome. Um, and it's probably because it's been mostly focused on wind. Um, I've got two questions. The first one is, do you think that the current controls in the development approval process can be changed to streamline these projects, given that they do cost a lot of money and banks aren't willing to um, wait that long. And secondly, um, do you have any ideas as to what, in your views, um, you think that might be? I'm sure Kane's brimming with ideas on this one. Thanks, thanks, Tristan. Um, look, I mean, I think the short of it is, uh, as we, in this case, as we develop more wind farms, we get a better understanding uh, about their impacts, about the uh, concerns of local communities about the planning regime in each jurisdiction around Australia and the extent to which it facilitates um, the pretty quick deployment of these of these projects. Um, so I think we're you know we've been on a bit of a learning curve right around the country, and I think there's examples of where states have refined their planning regimes. And I think South Australia is probably an example where its planning regime is pretty supportive for wind technology. There's no coincidence that South Australia currently sees about 50% of the country's wind farms, and so they've got more experience. Uh, they've developed their planning regime to essentially, you know, I think, recognise the, the challenges and the real issues that need to be dealt with, but equally to, uh, to move through those as quickly and practically as, as possible. Um, that's a good example. There's, better exam there's not so good examples uh, elsewhere around the country. I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> can we just get a question up the back there? Um, can, so just put your hands up, but can we get a mic to preferably someone up there who's waiting for a question? Uh, hi, this is a question mainly for Christine. Um, I'm assuming you may have picked up here while you've been in Australia that it's not as strong an environment for renewables as other countries. Um, that we're going through some arguments around renewable policy and climate policy that I think especially Europe probably would have gone through a number of years ago. Um, can you comment on why it's different in Europe, in particular um, from where the, the strength or level of interaction from, I guess, governments, the level of bipartisan support, industry, the amount of you know, industry support from, or uh, I guess industry opposition from the old industries, and also the wider community and not-for-profit organisations? Uh, well, effectively, uh, I think we have to look into the driving factors for uh, renewables policy, and, and, and those are very different from one place to the other, is always called as, referred to as the, the triangle of, uh, of renewables policy. Uh, what, are the, what are the drivers? It can be energy security, uh, it can be environmental uh, concerns, uh, and it is industrial policy. I mean, I guess that uh, there is a, an inherent difference on when it comes to energy security between Australia and the European Union. I mean, clearly, 
we are not blessed uh, with uh, so many resources as uh, as you are here and uh, and the start uh, of of renewables um, promotion was clearly uh, environmental concerns and was uh, energy security concerns and we see that more and more countries they really go uh, towards the promotion of renewables uh, out of industrial uh, industrial concerns because politicians are and I guess that's the same in all parts of the world are very sensitive to being re-elected and uh, if they manage to create jobs uh, then uh, that uh, that gives them uh, quite a good um, a good score uh, among voters but what what we also see we see an increasing trend for uh, for people uh, wanting to have a sustainable energy supply, and um, and I often refer to in these debates uh, to the, the the statement and the announcement of Germany to phase out nuclear after the Fukushima accident last year. This is not something that uh, that that was born in the head of Mrs. Merkel. Let's be very clear; she's a nuclear physicist. So I don't think that she was really keen on, 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 on getting rid of nuclear, but it was clearly the population who said, stop, we don't want any more nuclear in this country. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was at the, at the basis basically for um, getting the, the energy transition going. And I think this is also something that also very interesting for me that uh, you have hardly heard in, in Australian news. Uh, maybe you have not even heard it, but. Uh, or, or more or less last weekend, I'm get, uh, getting a bit lost with uh, jet lag and uh, different time zones and, and whatever, I think it was last weekend, the uh, Japanese government has agreed to phase out, uh, to phase out nuclear. And again there, uh, this is definitely something uh, where the population is starting to, um, to, uh, to play a role. And uh, we have many countries around the world, I think, where energy policy uh, was uh, was not always uh, democratically uh, debated. Uh, for example, in the country where I currently live, in France, uh, the energy policy was always fixed uh, by the elite of the country, and so there was never any debate about uh, about actually the role of nuclear and chairs and, and whatsoever. All very centralized, and uh, out of a sudden, in the last uh, presidential election campaign, uh, the the whole uh, debate about energy choices was starting to be an issue and, uh, and the newly elected um, president of France, François Hollande, announced in the election campaign that he will reduce the share from electricity from nuclear from 75 to 50% by 2020, 2025. Uh, there is, uh, what that means in terms of terawatt hours for the country is, is quite huge. And so I think that just shows that, um, that the population uh, and the impact of the population on choices of the future should not uh, be, uh, be underestimated, especially in, uh, in democracies uh, such as ours. I need to do something I don't normally do, and that is defend the Australian policy framework. Um, we actually have now got bipartisan support to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 2020 by 5% below the 2000 level unconditionally, and conditionally if the, if the rest of the world continues to make any sort of progress, by 15%. We've got an emissions trading scheme in place, which is probably one of the most extensive in the world, even though it might be somewhat modest, and we have a 20% renewable target, which, by the way, looks like it's going to be more like a 25-something percent, who knows what the forecast is, of renewable energy by 2020. So, I mean, I wouldn't agree that, by the way, that we haven't got a pretty good, robust policy outcome. I mean, some of these things are much more recent, you know, particularly around the, the um, uh, emissions trading scheme, and we certainly don't have the same degree of bipartisan support for some of these policy elements that you see in, in some parts of Europe. Uh, and the other thing that's very important to this, and the other mega trend that I don't know that was brought up before in Christine's presentation, is gas. And gas around the world is a big deal in terms of the energy mix. So, for example, in the US last year, even though there was significant growth in renewables, there was much more growth in gas. And that's going to have a big impact, not only on emissions, but also on renewables, I think. Yep. Uh, can we go for another question? Yes, just, just here. Thanks very much. Roger Dargaville from University of Melbourne. Uh, question for Christine. When, when you get to very high penetrations of renewables, you run into a problem that you, don't, you can't uh, control the dispatch of especially wind and solar. Uh, what steps have been taken in Europe, what, what, what uh, mechanisms have been planned to be able to deal with the variability 
in renew renewables, especially wind and solar? Uh, yeah, effectively, um, that's absolutely correct. Uh, there are certain renewables that are variable. Uh, there are others that are uh, providing uh, power when, whenever it is needed. And that's why I think uh, it is really important to, to always talk about the mix of renewables. I mean, you have, uh, you have hydropower, you have biomass, uh, that could really uh, provide uh, stability there. And uh, we do have uh, lots of examples uh, in, in Germany, uh, in Spain, in Denmark, where uh, it was uh, in Denmark, in, in Portugal, where uh, it, it, it was absolutely, which uh, track records were um, shares of 50% of, uh, of electricity from, uh, from wind and solar at certain moments could easily be integrated into the system. Um, you need to, to of course, uh, factor in uh, load management, uh, and of course, you need to uh, adapt your, your your grid and your system to high shares of re variable renewables. I mean, the whole um, the whole uh, high uh, renewable scenarios that we we talk, uh, they will not be able to be implemented by uh, by just uh, continuing uh, the, the design of our grids as they are right at the moment. So there is the importance to effectively uh, look into grid design and, uh, and also look into uh, interconnection. I mean, there is a big debate right at the moment going on uh, about the, the European uh, grid, which needs to be far more interconnected. Uh, and, uh, and where, of course, uh, also a debate lies, again, with the public, because people often oppose uh, new, new grid lines. And I think there is also really a need of, of dialogue with people uh, because without, uh, without extension of infrastructure, we are going to effectively run into, into problems with integrating these, these uh, high shares of variable renewables. Can I just ask on, on that, um, uh, Kane, your, the, the wind industry uh, in this country uh, has, a, has a very high concentration of renewables in, in one location, you know, and that's wind in, in South Australia. And uh, at the same time, th th there are some some uh, some economic constraints there. In that, when the wind blows and blows very very hard, full electricity prices tend to become very low. Um, uh, how is the industry sort of looking at, at, at that particular issue? What are the sort of stresses that that's 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 putting on on them, and how they're they're reacting to the fact that essentially they're um, the electricity market itself is sort of pushing them out. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think this is a pretty hot debate right at the moment, as Tony said earlier, I and mean, it has consequences for the whole energy sector, uh, and obviously including that as, as renewables plant operating at the moment and into the future. Um, I guess just to, to sort of clarify that, I mean, I guess we've seen periods, uh, particularly recently, with very strong winds, uh, renewables are dispatched into the grid and essentially drive down wholesale prices. And I guess to a certain degree, in the broader sort of public policy debate, uh, driving down wholesale prices from a consumer perspective is a good thing, given all of the other trends on retail electricity prices that are pushing up and, and pushing up prices quite quickly. Um, but you're right, um, it obviously does have an impact on uh, on the returns of other renewable investments and obviously uh, the, the feasibility uh, into the future. Uh, and I think that's, you know, as, as we've discussed, the, the energy sectors really is in a state of transition at the moment with uh, future demand changing, with uh, more renewables being driven in, and only now we're starting to come to terms with what impact that has both on consumer demand for renewables uh, at a domestic level, but also uh, ultimately the grid uh, and also the, the wholesale energy prices. I guess the short answer to your question is it does have an impact. Uh, there's no there's no question about that. Uh, but as the this transition continues to occur, I think what we'll see is I mean ultimately it's the renewable energy target that continues to drive renewables into the market and continue to drive it towards a point of at least 20% by 2020, and that in effect is what will make uh, wind farms and other forms of renewables commercially viable between now and 2020. But but is there a, an issue with um, the need for us to perhaps put put wind farms in in other places. The wind might be great in South Australia, but um, the, the, can the grid really? Um, maybe the grid can cope with more, but in the end, the prices won't be very good for wanting to develop new projects anyway. Um, that we need to either um, uh, expand the grid, um, improve interconnections, 
or, or start developing projects in, in other locations. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a balancing act, really. I mean, if you're looking to develop a wind project, you're looking for where's the resource the strongest, uh, where is the grid essentially the strongest so you can get your any energy to market, and essentially where is the greatest amount of demand, where's the greatest amount of strength in the uh, within the energy market in that region. And it's a com complicated sort of matrix, if you like, of those three factors. And you're right, as uh, wholesale prices move in one region, uh, as uh, network and interconnectors are augmented and strengthened, uh, as we chase the best resource around the country, the location of the best wind farms, and this will, this will be essentially the same. In fact, we're already seeing this occur to solar as its deployment increases. Uh, ultimately, all of those factors come together to make to drive decisions about where those projects are going to be built with which technologies right around the country. I guess we see a future where there is an assortment of different renewable technologies put into different parts of the electricity grid, representing strengths and weaknesses, representing different forms of intermittency, uh, helping to balance the grid, and we, we see that already um, globally in different parts of Australia, and that way we can actually sustain much higher penetrations of renewable energy broadly and start to pretty quickly phase out some of our uh, most carbon intensive forms of generation. I think we've got time for two more questions. Yeah. Um, just, just here at the front, please. Can, can you just keep your hand up so that it's obvious? Yep. Uh, Ken Guthrie. Uh, look, uh, a question probably for Tony or Kane. Uh, Christine's mentioned a couple of times today about uh, Europe having a renewable heating and cooling target. Um, our our uh, situation in Australia tends to be that if we put green electrons into the grid, then the problem's solved. Uh, however, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, greenhouse um, that comes from other parts of the energy system. And uh, I just wonder what we can do about getting a more balanced approach. I think why don't I take one part of it and the bit that I think there's clearly, and, and Kane referred to it a little bit earlier in terms of the grid, um, there are some serious challenges in relation to as we move away from what we've been used to in the past. Um, every industry around the world, energy is one of them, but not just energy, the system basically has evolved to suit the incumbents. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but you get an enormous amount of in inertia in the system. And so as a consequence of that, our system actually does pretty well if you're a big coal-fired power station or gas-fired power station. It ain't so good if you're a modest generator of the sort of scale that we might be concerned about here this evening. And so what that means is we've got to address those issues. So finding ways to overcome the barriers that seriously do exist to the connection of medium-scale wind, solar, solar thermal and so forth is a critical part of the regulatory process. That doesn't come through the Renewable Energy Target or the ETS. It comes through addressing fundamentally those barriers in the regulatory process. And that's one of the things I think we need to do somewhat urgently. Uh, just just on, um, on Ken's question about um, the, the need to perhaps be doing something about heat the, you know, we're burning a lot of gas, say, in Victoria to, to produce heat and, and steam, not to produce electricity, and there doesn't seem to be right. much it's going on about that. <laughs> yep. Uh, I mean, I think from my perspective, if you look at it at, a, at least at a domestic level, I mean, I think Tony covered some of, the, some of the sort of commercial scale stuff, but at a domestic level, I mean, I think the reality is that people are now starting to come to terms and starting to be exposed to the, to the fuller costs of supplying energy from traditional sources to their home. And, you know, I think we've seen this over the recent period, certainly in the uptake of solar PV. Uh, and I think increasingly into the future, things like solar hot water, where people are starting to seriously look at those full costs and consider the alternatives, uh, consider how they can generate their own electricity, how they can more efficiently heat water and avoid the higher retail electricity price in the future. But I think Tony's right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of structural uh, regulatory f reform that needs to go with that. Okay, one more question, um, just over here, please. Hi, um, there's been a lot of focus on reducing emissions from the electricity sector. I was just wondering what focus has been given on to reducing emissions from the transport sector, um, particularly petrol uh, powered cars, because you can use biodiesel bio for trucks, um, and diesel engines, but not for petrol engines. So 
where are we going in terms of reducing emissions in the transport sec sector? I thought you were going to ask about how we reduce emissions from cows and sheep, actually, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, be belching cars. <laughs> I think the answer part of it partly is, you know, you, you, you go to the lowest hanging fruit first. And so in Australia, compared with many parts of the world where transport is a much higher proportion of their greenhouse gas emissions, Australia it's not so it's not so high. And so the biggest challenge for us, we've got these fossil fuel fossil fuel fired plants, and what we've got to do is really start to address that. Now that doesn't mean that you don't transport and agriculture have to be addressed, but I think it's a matter of priorities. Um, I think the other thing to, to note, I mean, you know, we've seen massive leaps forward in, um, in battery technology recently. Uh, I think it's a really exciting area and we're starting to see, you know, pilot scale um, uh, battery technology rolled out around the transport sector in, in, around the world and starting to be piloted here domestically. And I think it becomes really interesting when you consider that in the context of balancing uh, balancing the grid, uh, using some of the intermittent source of renewables, renewable energy um, powered transport sector, I think is a pretty exciting future. And I think that's, that's becoming much, uh, much closer than, than some people realise. Um, yes, Marcy. But you're touching an abs absolutely critical point. And for example, in Germany, we have a target of 1 million electric vehicles on the road by 2020. And in terms of all the other targets, probably Germany is doing the least good on this one. Um, there's a lot of discussion, how do you bring that electric um, mobility um, on the roads? And from the science perspective, it's interesting. We had particular, some models that were projecting really high costs to achieve two degrees. We had them five years ago. We had them coming through the reports in IPCC as well. Now, over the last five years, we dicked a bit down of where do these high costs, for example, coming from? Two of the high, most high-cost models coming from the US, they were so high-cost because they did not include the option of electric mobility uh, in their models. And so while our modelers do more and more as well come up with mitigation options in the transport sector and the uh, electric mobility is the key, um, that really drives down the cost of our projections of uh, how costly it is to achieve the two degree target. And just one last final point on the 2017 uh, date that you mentioned before, the IEA made that very important statement that by 2017, we really have to stop investing in new coal power, uh, coal power and new fossil fuel resources. It is not that we have to stop emissions from transport and um, coal-fired power plants by 2017, but the calculation is that by that time we have so much installed power from fossil fuel resources that if we use them up to the end of their lifetimes, we will have enough emissions to make the, to, to hit the two degree uh, line. That doesn't mean necessarily that if we go up to 2025, we couldn't make the two degree line. But what it means then that we have a lot of stranded investments of the new coal fire power plants that are coming up right now. So by 2017, peaking global emissions, that's the cost optimal path. If we do it later, it becomes all the more costly and we have all the more stranded emission, um, stranded investments. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. It just it's a lot harder. I hand it over to David. Well, can I ask everyone, first of all, just to thank the panel? <laughs> but could I uh, just say, by way of a conclusion, we've clearly had a fascinating discussion, debate, wide range of points this evening. This is all hinged around Christine's presentations. I did want to take this opportunity to thank Christine, not only for her efforts this week, and there's still, I think, a day to go before you get on the plane home, but also uh, to thank all of you uh, for being here tonight. It's been a privilege not only to have all of you here, but also have the opportunity to listen to Christine and to bring uh, to this debate her international knowledge. I particularly wanted to thank Tristan uh, for chairing tonight, obviously from the work he does as a journalist in the field who was able to bring that extra uh, degree of decisiveness to his questions I think is always very really useful in a discussion like this. But also if I could thank Tony, Malta and Kane for their time and their contribution. A wide range of perspectives is always very useful. Now, 
in thanking them, and I'll ask you to join with me and thank you everyone in a moment, none of this would actually be possible without our co-hosts tonight. So if I could particularly thank Gemma and Susanna of the Melbourne Energy Institute and Angela of the Grattan Institute, and ask me to join with me in thanking them particularly for enabling us to be here this evening. For those of you who don't know, you can get a recorded version of tonight's session on not only the CEC's website, but also the MEI, MEI and the Grattan websites. Now, all of us will want to play a major role in this debate, the CEC, Grattan and the MEI. We all have a role to play in the debate. All of you have a role to play, not only today, but in the future in this debate. And it's great to see so many uh, people here tonight. I did really particularly want to thank this opportunity, this opportunity to particularly thank my colleague Kate Greer, who's organised uh, the visit here, quietly sitting at the front there, but to thank Kate in particular on behalf of us all for bringing together this visit over this week. <laughs> and finally, to thank uh, my colleagues Kristen, Tessa, Alicia, Laura and Beth for their work tonight. Very often it's people in the background who make it all happen. There's now a fantastic opportunity for a bit of informal networking, talk to speakers, etc. But just bear in mind, uh, it's been a long day for some of the speakers. We don't want to delay people unduly, but do exchange the business cards at the end. But thank you all very much indeed for taking your time up and coming here this evening. Thank you again to the panel. And enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>